and welcome to True Crime with me, Emma Kenny. Thanks for joining me. If this is the first time that you've ever stumbled across my channel, well, I release crime content on a Wednesday and a Sunday religiously. So if you like crime and consistency, then this is the channel for you. Also, join me for one of my live chats because I do premieres, which means that I'll be there having a natter with you all and the community is amazing. Kenny's crime cool is growing and I love it. Also, big shout out to all my Patreon fans. Thank you for supporting me. It means that I can dedicate more time to my research and to my content creation, which is awesome. Also, yes, hoodies are out. Bang to rights, currently. It's my favorite saying in the world. You all know that because if you've watched me, it's kind of in every single video. Bang to rights. So why not put it on a hoodie? Yeah, we're releasing hoodies as well because you've been asking for it. Literally, you guys ask and we just do it. So if you want to get some, they will be on the merch site. So have a look, invest in some quality crime merchandise. Also, just want to make it clear that today's case is one that is massively in the press right now. And I did think about not doing it because of the fact that I've recently covered Arthur Lebin Joe Hughes's murder and Star Hobson's case has been in the news at the same time. And I didn't know whether I wanted to cover another child death so soon, but I got the notes and I was like, I am absolutely going to cover this case because we need to tell her story and most importantly we need to start asking questions about how the hell this child ended up dead because she absolutely in no way shape or form should have been left in the situation that she was in and that's why I want to cover it because for me if there are failures that need calling out regarding the services that are meant to be protecting children, then we need to call them out very, very loudly. I mean, we all know about Arthur recently, we know about Victoria Columbe, we know about Baby P, and what is happening that we're getting to a position of repetition, and I'm telling a similar story so soon after the last one. And I think it's so powerful when we share these stories because what happens is it makes us be alerted to the changes that need to occur. And it also means that we can start putting pressure on services, on politicians, on the government in general to stop saying that lessons are going to be learned. A child dying is not a lesson that needs to be learned. A child dying is a crime that should be prevented. It's as simple as that. So the case that I'm covering today is all about trying to bring into focus exactly how that beautiful, beautiful child went from being a thriving little girl to essentially a story in the papers. And hopefully I'm going to do it justice. So Star Hobson was born 21st of May 2019. And if you think about it now, we're in 2021 and she's no longer here. That's how small she was when she died. Literally six months after she was born, her 18 year old mother, Frankie Smith, began this new relationship with a 27 year old girl called Savannah Brockhill. Within a year of that connection, 16 month old Star would be dead within one year of that new relationship beginning. It's worth noting when we think about the kind of individuals who are involved in child murder, there are lots of anticipated ideas about what their family will have been like. So who formed this child that became a killer? And to be fair, when we look at Smith's background, well, she had a good upbringing. She was in Bailden area of Bradford. She was brought up by a very loving family and she had a lot of support. So when we're looking at what went on in this girl's life to mean that she was willing essentially to be an accomplice to her own child's death, I think we have to be very fair to the family and say that there weren't red flags, that she was certainly given the support that she required in her life and her home, her familial home, where she'd been brought up was always a loving one and one that would have stayed loving and offered her any of the support that she required to help bring up her child. So we cannot lay blame in any way, shape or form at their feet. That upbringing obviously formed a young woman that up until meeting her new partner was something that we could say at least gave her a foundation of understanding about what good relationships were. I'm not saying that Smith had a great identity with how to be a mother, for example, because I don't think she did and we'll talk about that in a minute, but she certainly knew what it was like to have loving relationships. Now she was only 17 when she gave birth to her baby daughter Star and all of us can have some empathy for being a 17 year old and being a mum. That's hard. 
And I'm not saying for one minute that single mums at that age don't boss it and create incredible childhoods for their children. We know there are lots of examples of people like that. But I think it's more that you just can't be fundamentally prepared at 17. At 17 years of age, I was just falling out of pubs and stuff like a lot of us were, right? At 17 years of age, I was thinking about, oh, who is my boyfriend going to be? At 17 years of age, I was thinking in terms of what potentially I could achieve in the future without necessarily thinking about what I needed to do to achieve what I wanted to do in the future. You know, everything was much more up in the air. And then to imagine suddenly having a child where you are fully responsible for that life and to know that your life has changed dramatically and will always be changed dramatically. There's a lot of psychological changes that need to take place and I don't think that Smith was ready for it. I'm not saying she didn't want to start at all. I think she really did, even if she hadn't thought through the implications of what it would be like having a child. But certainly she wasn't prepared psychologically, socially or emotionally for the responsibility. And like I said, we can have empathy for her in that respect because very few people genuinely feel prepared at that age to actually become a parent. And because of this situation, it was tough. She was a young single mum. And another thing that really additionalised what I would consider the problematic relationship she had with her child. And when I say problematic, I'm not talking about what happened at the end of the relationship with her child. I'm talking about the just committing to having a child and being fully responsible for that child and present for that child because she struggled with that. One of the big factors probably that lent itself to this situation being more challenging for her was she had quite severe learning difficulties. I mean, her IQ was incredibly low. She was in the bottom 2% of the country IQ wise. And she was also very immature for her age. That was known. So people who are around her recognize that she has a childishness and an immaturity, and I suppose a naivety. So that gullibility obviously means that people who are quite strong characters will be able to manipulate you a great deal more easily than they would if you were a strong personality. And a psychiatrist who assessed her actually confirmed that she was really unusually compliant. So she was somebody who just wanted to do what others were asking of her to some degree. And in particular, she sought approval of authority figures. So if you have an individual come into your world and they are more authoritarian around you and you are somebody who's compliant, obviously that's going to put you in a scenario where they can manipulate you very heavily because it kind of applies to the psyche that you have. And we see this in relationships, you know, even for yourselves, you, when you look at your intimate relationships, we'll often see that we're playing out these kind of roles. So let's look at people who have got a critical parent, rebellious child relationship. So you've got two adults, but actually one of them is highly critical and the other one's really rebellious towards that. You know, these kind of experiences that we have through our lives are often carved out in our childhoods. And certainly with Smith, we can see that this problem with her intelligence level meant that she was at bigger risk of finding herself in these problematic scenarios. She lived with her mother, Yvonne, for a short time after Star was born. I'm going to say that would have been a really good place to stay. Because realistically, when you're 17 and you've got a child, having your elders around you, one, it provides support for you just on a physical level. You know, if you want to go out, you've got somebody to help you. Two, it means that you can ask for advice and guidance. We all need that when we have children. And most importantly, it means that if there are any issues with your parenting, it's picked up on to some degree because they are there all the time watching you. But she's only there a short while. And then she goes and gets her own flat in Keithley, West Yorkshire. I don't want to be massively judgmental at this point because I appreciate fundamentally what a challenge all of this would have been at 17 but I have to note that as far as I'm concerned and after going through all of the notes and looking at the court reports and forming an opinion based on what I've heard through other people's evidence she certainly wasn't ready to be a mum she just wasn't she didn't realize the connection required, the commitment required and of course the restraints and constraints placed on you when you have a child. As far as I can tell, she just wanted to carry on going out, having fun, and essentially being 17, doing what other girls her age were gonna do. Also, she clearly had a very close relationship with her mother, but I think the boundaries were a bit blurred with respect because she was often out drinking with her. And again, I appreciate that every parent chooses a type of relationship with their child that is right for them. 
So again, I don't want to blame her mum. All I'm saying is, I think that you are always a parent first. And the way that you behave around your children represents the way that they feel is acceptable behave elsewhere in many circumstances. So if you are going out drinking till all hours with your child, you're more of a friend and actually what we know is that children don't want friends in their parents. Yes, they want their parents to be agreeable and friendly. Of course they do. They want to feel like they can tell you anything, of course. That's what we all want for our kids. But they also want to know that there are boundaries. It makes them feel safe. They know that you are giving them the best advice and guidance based on your behaviours too. And I think if you're going out getting really drunk with your kid, particularly when they've got a new child on the scene, then you're kind of giving them a permission base to do things that ideally they need to rethink behaviour-wise, which is she shouldn't be out drinking all the time, she should be with her child. But nonetheless, there's obviously a close relationship there. And their drinking behaviours would last to like 4am in the morning. And if it wasn't for Smith's friend Holly Jones, she wouldn't have been able to do that. Holly Jones was a free babysitter essentially. And throughout this, I think is relatively heroic, if I'm honest. So this is what enables Smith and her mother to go out. They have somebody who's willing to step in and look after Star. Now in September 2019, this is when Star's just four months old, Smith's on a holiday in Bridlington. At this point, Smith regularly leaves Star with friends so that she can go out drinking, as I've said. In fact, I would say that there was this constant reliance on friends and family to take responsibility of Star so that she could just go off and have fun. Again, I am acknowledging she was 17. This is not something that's outside the realms of normality for a child of her age wanting to carry on doing things that she would have always been able to do prior to having a child. The problem is that she had a child. So she kind of has the child, but then just goes back to how it was to be a teenager, which is not conducive to parenting, is it? So at this point, Smith is obviously on her own and the father isn't on the scene which again is a problem. Let's be honest, if you haven't got a supportive partner, everything's gonna be more challenging. And also to note that men often leave and actually the woman is genuinely left holding the baby. And that can be a challenge because when you have a child, it's both of you who should be equally responsible. And for him to just go off and start university and kind of abandon that situation certainly is not ideal per se. So just to acknowledge that it's not just her responsibility here. In spite of the fact that this situation isn't ideal, what I will tell you about Star is that she was absolutely adored. And I mean adored by her extended family, genuinely. She could have been there 24 seven and they would have been happy with that. And I really wanna bring that home for all of you because often people have got some pretty strong judgments around the families of people who lose children. And I cannot express how loved she was. She really, really clearly was. And this is noted by everybody who knew the family. Star was literally a star to that family. In fact, they called her little baby blue eyes. That was what her grandparents used to refer to her as. That was 69 year old Annetta Smith and her 61 year old partner, postman David Fawcett. They both were from Shipley in West Yorkshire. Now, not long after splitting up with Star's father in November, 2019, Smith goes to a pub in Bradford called The Sun Pub. And it's at this point she meets 27-year-old Savannah Brockhill. She was working on the door. Now, Savannah Brockhill was a pub bouncer and also a keen amateur boxer. So the very fact that we now know that firstly, she's on the doors, and secondly, she likes boxing, means that she has a penchant for violence. And I'm putting that in there because that means that she has, shall we say, more masculine traits to her. Now, obviously she's female, but the point is she's in an arena that when we look at personality traits and actually validated empirically researched personality traits, she's more on the masculine side. And that's not for me for one minute to say that men are violent, it's not. I know that guys get told that all the time. I know the majority of men are not violent. But the point is, if you're seeking out as a woman that kind of environment, it says something about your personality traits. And for her, there is more of that masculine desire and a willingness to kind of associate with violence. She likes it. And I think we can all associate with certain bouncers. And I'm sure some of you watching now and you've worked as bouncers and you know exactly what I'm saying. 
it can be a place, can't it, where physical altercations are a regular experience. It takes a particular type of mindset to be able to manage that. And I think when you think about female traits, and I know that people out there will be like, well, females and males are exactly the same. We're not. I mean, we're more similar than different, definitely. But there are these particular traits that stand out more with females and stand out more with males. And there is a spectrum. Some of us are bang in the middle, some of us are at polarities, you know, and everything in between. But that's where she fits there. Now she's lied to friends in the past and she actually claimed that she was related to Tyson Fury. I mean, I'd like to be related to Tyson Fury. I'm not gonna lie. I think Tyson Fury's hilarious. I think he's got a really good soul. Wouldn't wanna get in a fight with him though, clearly. But the point is, she decides to manifest this kind of fantasy scenario where they have links family-wise, and it's not true. She'd met him once. Because if that's the fact, maybe I can start saying that I'm related to Philip Schofield. I'm not related to Philip Schofield, by the way. But you can see that this gives you an idea into her mindset that she wants to amplify these connections with strong people because Tyson Fury of course is an incredibly strong man and you wouldn't want to get in the ring with him and she's really building this up because if she can kind of tell people well not only am I somebody who works on the doors who's a boxer I'm even related to probably one of the most profoundly successful boxers in the UK that gives her more power when it comes down to, you be careful around me, I've got links to really powerful people and so on and so forth. So she's building that reputational picture up that's important for her. Now she came from a traveling background and Tyson Fury did too, so I guess that's another link that she used to connect them. And she left school at 10. And even though a lot of people will be like, that is really young to leave school. I worked with traveling families and genuinely, most of them don't like the idea of their children going to high school. They feel that it creates moral issues. They think that it can increase sexually promiscuous behavior. They feel that it's indoctrinating, that the subjects that they talk about are not considered in line with the morals that they have as travelers. So often they won't go to high school. But understandably, this to some degree limits the amount of opportunities that a child can then pursue. Because whether we agree or otherwise, there are a lot of jobs that require things like GCSEs. But nonetheless, like I said, culturally, this is completely normal. She did work in end of life care before she got a job in security, which when I think about her mindset, there's a part of me that wants to say, oh, well that's kind of sweet, isn't it? Going and working in end of life care because that's the most vulnerable you're ever going to be. And you're going to want people around you who look after you and care for you, make you feel safe, make you feel comfortable. However, if you are somebody who is quite negative in your mindset, if you're somebody who, let's say, is quite aggressive and likes to have a sense of power, then if you go and work in end-of-life care, you're constantly working with people on the brink between life and death. And I wonder whether there is a macabre side to this particular woman that she kind of enjoyed knowing that she was in that place and space with the individuals who were in the most vulnerable times of their life, being cared for by an individual who's probably feeling the most powerful because there's such a polarity between their states. At 19, Brock Hill actually came out as bisexual, which I'm sure would have presented some challenges, particularly with a cultural background, but nonetheless also shows that she's relatively assertive because she wants to live her true life and she wants to be honest with the people around her about her sexuality in particular. Now, the start of Smith and Brock Hill's relationship basically begins the downfall of Smith and, of course, the spiral that occurs in Star's life. Remember, when Brock Hill and Smith meet, Star is six months of age. I mean, she's literally brand new to this planet. She's adored by her extended family. And essentially, this relationship should have marked a new chapter in Smith having some security in her life because, you know, she's met a partner and that presents lots of opportunities for support to ensue but it was about as far away from the reality of what played out as I could potentially describe, honestly. Everything that you want in a relationship is about as far away from what was received in this situation. Smith became absolutely obsessed with Brock Hill. Now we know there's a couple of years age difference. We know that Brock Hill's a very strong character. 
We also appreciate that Smith is someone who's relatively vulnerable and easily led, but nonetheless, she fixates on Brock Hill. And it's at this point that you can almost categorise Star's needs just taking a complete backseat. So the emphasis that Smith has in her life in this moment is to be with Brockville per se, at a cost to everything else. To give you some ideas of how it played out neglectfully towards her daughter, well, Smith would spend hours and hours on the phone to Brockville every single day. And when she was doing that, she was ignoring her child. Simple as that. And whilst a lot of people will say, well, that's not necessarily that neglectful, you know, the child was still safe and warm and was in a space where she was protected, but actually it's hugely neglectful. And there's so much evidence to show the damage that is done, particularly to young babies, when they aren't stimulated constantly and made to feel safe and that their primary caregiver is there to deal with their needs. If you are spending hours and hours on the phone to somebody, then you are not present for your child. And the fact that this very intense relationship begins signals a devastating impact on the mother-child relationship at this point. As I told you earlier on, Brock Hill definitely had very aggressive traits. She was known to be an aggressive individual. She didn't just work on the doors and she wasn't just a boxer. She was also somebody who worked as a security guard at the Eco Power Environmental Recycling Plant. And the local residents who knew her, where she lived in Shipley, said that she was, quote, notoriously violent. Just think about that notoriously violent. That's not somebody who has an edge. It's not somebody who we see occasionally gets themselves into conflict situations. Notoriously violent means in the area where she lived, she was literally known repeatedly to be violent, aggressive, and consistently remained that way to a point where she was given notoriety because of those traits. Also another quote, handy with a fist and volatile temper. So we're getting a very clear picture of a woman who's quite happy to use force to get what she wants. She's also known in relationships to be highly controlling and very, very jealous. If we could paint a picture of somebody who you don't want to connect with, Brock Hill has every single trait. It is really concerning when a human being isn't just jealous and controlling, they also have the physical wherewithal to be able to initiate and retain that level of control because their traits and their power and physical self has the capacity to do so. So we know Smith is very vulnerable and this now additionalized with somebody who's violent enters that picture. So it's a cooking pot, a possibility of problems, isn't it? Brock Hill was known to post quite a bit on Snapchat and in one Snapchat video, she gave a warning to people. In fact, she warned guys and girls because clearly Smith and Brockhill had had relationships with both and therefore when she's talking about Smith and the ownership and territory around Smith, she's making it clear that anybody who gets in contact with her is going to face a backlash. And she actually goes on Snapchat and says not to contact Smith, not to send friend requests even. So forget wanting to have a relationship with her. This girl is telling people you don't even contact her to be a friend. I mean, that in itself is pretty terrifying, isn't it? And the reason that she then explains that they shouldn't get in contact with her is because they won't be able to keep the kneecaps. Basically, she'll kneecap them. Literally, that's what she says. And she ends it saying that she's the number one psycho, cheerfully smiling, gleefully smiling when she's saying it. What does that tell you about her? She's proud. She's really glad that she's known for this kind of violence. She's glad that people will be aware that there will be consequences to their actions if they even so much as look at her girlfriend in the wrong way. And that she's also threatening the type of violence that she's gonna use. Guys and girls need to remember the fact that Frankie is with me. She keeps getting a lot of message requests and friends requests. She's not gonna accept, especially tramps like you. And if you want to keep your kneecaps, I suggest you stop sending her them. She's with the number one psycho. I mean, it's really disconcerting as well how her facial expression during the video doesn't match her words. But her eyes seem to give it away, don't they? She's smiling away, but there's this very cold look in her eyes. And I think that's one of the things with Brockhill. You can see 
almost directly to her interior by the way that her eyes present themselves. Now, the text that accompanied the video basically said that they would put anybody in a chair for the rest of their lives if they were so much to look at Smith wrongly. And it included emojis of a red cross, a knife and a bomb. And we can all retrospectively go, oh, well, now we think about this, that was signals of danger that we should have listened to. But actually, if anybody does that at any point, that is highly threatening, highly unusual, very narcissistic, incredibly coercive and threatening and not just threatening to the people that she's challenging who are going to come into her potential girlfriend's lives and wreak havoc for her. No, it's actually letting people know that she's controlling that relationship. So the consequences are mutual, both for the individual who would contact a girlfriend, but also potentially for her girlfriend and of course for her girlfriend's daughter. And that in itself, if I'd been looking at it from a safeguarding perspective, thinking this girl is around this child, that would have caused a real red flag. And I'm bringing that up at this point because the failures in this case are staggering. And I think at the end of it, you will probably feel quite angry. And I'm just prepping you for that because these kind of insights into people's characters are incredibly telling. Remember, notoriously violent, recognized as an abusive person, previous problems with jealousy, massive problems with anger and threatening criminal behavior. Big red flags. Now, on one occasion, Brockhill actually sent a message to Smith's own sister asking if Smith had cheated on her. So this jealousy is playing out. And this is what the message said. It said, I'm broken. I'll stab someone tonight, I swear. I don't care about kids in the house. I will rage. Fuck it. They're gonna need to police in the house to take me away. What does that tell you again? She doesn't care about authority. She doesn't care about threatening people in writing. She is motivated by the way that she actually feels in the moment, even if it's not based in truth. And she's letting people know how far she'll go. I will stab someone tonight. So when she has unmanageable emotions, when she is struggling emotionally, as opposed to sitting with that feeling and figuring out what is going on for me? Why do I feel this way? How do I channel these negative feelings in a way that aren't harmful to me or others? She can't do that. Her immediacy is to say, who do I blame for the way I feel? How do I control the interior feelings that I'm experiencing by projecting it onto somebody else, taking it out on somebody else, and then feeling that I've managed them accordingly? Now, of course, we know that can't happen. We know that how we feel inside cannot be displaced by the way that we take it out on somebody else. All it does, it subdues it for a little amount of time, and then it plays out again, which is why people who don't resolve those kind of conflictual feelings constantly repeat those kind of actions. And Brockhill symbolizes this kind of human being, somebody who absolutely projects their feelings onto somebody else and then takes it out with rage and yet doesn't resolve a thing because the rage is within her. Also, massive boundary issue. You don't contact someone's sister and basically ask them to get their sister into trouble by confirming whether they're seeing somebody else. That in itself, again, shows that she has very poor impulse control. And throughout this, Rockhill has a major issue with impulse control. From the get-go, one of the things that stands out in this is that Brockhill took pure advantage of Smith's vulnerability. And that was noticed by every single person who knew Smith. All her family knew that her behavior had changed, that the relationship with Brockhill seemed to sour the connection between them. And immediately they start seeing a lot less of both her and Star. So Smith and Star just aren't fundamentally in the lives of the extended family as they were before. Remember, when you wanna control someone, rule one, isolate them. The more you can isolate them, fundamentally, the more you can break down the support network, you can prevent people from noticing things that are changing. And of course, if there's violence involved, that's very important. You don't want somebody bruised and battered turning up to see their family, it's gonna cause you issues. So it seems like from the get-go, Brock is doing that, she's removing Smith from under the noses, essentially, of her family. And getting somebody under control again, it's not what most of us wanna do. Like, think about that. When you're in a relationship, you want to be with your partner, you love your partner, you want to spend time with your partner. Most of that is a raising up of your partner, supporting your partner. And I also appreciate that there can be an intensity at the beginning of a relationship. A lot of us will have experienced that where we do just want to spend time with our partner. But that's a very connected 
and balanced way of being. It's just because, you know, there's a lot of fun to be had with your partner in the early days, isn't there? You don't want to be around your parents in that situation. But that tapers off. And then you start actually building your relationships with your wider family, usually bigger than they were before, because you've now got this additional person to share with them that makes you feel really special, that you've created this extension of who you are by bringing them into your world and into your family. That doesn't happen with Brock, Killen Smith. They very much become completely isolated. Star's great-granddad, David, the way he described it is he said that Brockhill was really crafty in the way that she went about isolating Smith. And you won't be surprised at all to know that very soon on in the relationship, Smith becomes a victim of domestic violence, and that is at Brockhill's hands. Brockhill has this horrendous jealousy. She gets really angry. The idea that anything could challenge their relationship consumes her. She's so desiring Smith to remain hers that anything that can compromise that in any way, shape or form, whether it's real or imagined, becomes centre stage. And because of these jealous rages, Smith starts getting injured. So she's noticed having bruises on her face and the family become immediately concerned about the fact that if she's violent towards Smith, well, the chances are she could be violent to Star as well. So they're immediately worried that this could become something even more dangerous than it already is. And I have to say, pretty much immediately, those concerns are justified. They start noticing marks and bruises on Star. And remember, they're not seeing her as often, but when they are seeing her, it's alerting them to the fact that why is this child suddenly getting bruised? And people can say, oh, well, children get bruised and so on and so forth. Of course, yes, we all know. I fell off everything. My parents were literally taken aside in hospital when I was a child and questioned by doctors because I was always in hospital. Why? I was a nightmare child who still, even though I got injured, thought it would be great to just throw myself off things. Turns out I couldn't fly and I didn't bounce. I just thudded and hurt myself considerably. But a lot of us know that these things happen in childhood, but the bruises are always registered as being appropriate versus inappropriate. So there are some bruises we expect to see on children, knees, for example, elbows, for example, even a bump on the head sometimes because that's how kids fall often. But when bruises are in certain places, it starts to make you very concerned because you're like, that is not a normal bruise to see. And that's what her family start noticing, that this doesn't seem like childhood bruises. They have had experiences with Star before. They know what her behavior is like. They haven't occurred before. So the fact that these bruises and marks are beginning to show after Brockhill walks into her life, that is drawing their attention to probable abuse. And they are right, absolutely right. Now, an ex-boyfriend of Smith's, 24-year-old Pete Penman, said that she actually confided in him about Brockhill's violence towards her and Star. He said that Smith said that Brockhill would hit Star when she got anything. And for whatever reason, she didn't feel that she was able to do anything about it because Brockhill was a bouncer. Now, with respect, I'll tell you there's a very simple resolve to this, Smith. Leave. There is a very simple way to manage this. Leave. Speak to the police, speak to social services. This idea that you are stuck in a relationship when somebody's being violent towards your child, it is a myth. It is a self-imposed prison. It's not a reality. She had a mother who would have taken her back. She had grandparents who would have taken her back. This is just not a reality of what she wanted to do. In lots of circumstances, I will bend and say, in coercive control, a lot of people are in scenarios where they just literally don't feel that they can leave because they're financially controlled. They don't have access to their passport. They literally can't leave the house without incredible violence. But I'll tell you what I know. I know that when violence transcends that individual and starts to affect their children, they are ridiculously more likely to get out because they don't really care about their own well-being, but damn, they care about their child's well-being. And Smith has options. So I think that she's saying this, she's paying lip service to the fact that she doesn't feel comfortable that Brockhill is being aggressive and violent towards her and her child, but she doesn't want to leave the relationship at all at this point. And Penman rightly so says, look, leave, go to social services, the right advice. He gave her the absolute right advice. And Smithy's response to that was that she didn't want to speak to social services because she was scared that she would lose Star. Now, on one level, we can all say, well, she wouldn't have lost Star because they would have supported her. That's also the right assumption to make. But I'll tell you what, she would have lost Star if she had gone to social services, told them what Brockhill was doing, and then remained in the relationship. 
So there is a reality if she was thinking, I don't want to get out of this relationship really. And even though there are issues within it and stars getting abused, if I confirm to social services that's the case, they're going to escalate it to a level four and the likelihood is they're going to remove Star or place Star with her parents or grandparents so that her safety is looked after if Smith refused to leave Brockhill. So that could well have been the quandary that she was in. She didn't want to leave the relationship. Now, I've also got to note that even though I'm going to draw on the injuries that occurred to Star, I want to make it clear it isn't possible to actually draw out who did what to her. So who would go on to inflict a multitude of injuries on Star is actually unclear. But ultimately, Brockhill and Smith, guess what they did? You're right, they just blamed each other. So it was a he says, she says situation. Essentially, when they were brought in, the easiest way to deal with it in their opinions was to say it was nothing to do with me, it was everything to do with them. And you know, it's not possible, is it? That's impossible. They can't both be lying, they can't both be telling the truth. One of them, is lying, both of them are lying, and I think that the likelihood is they both were violent to Star. And I know it's a very horrible thing to be confronted with when the police are questioning you, and it's quite normal for people to try to reject it, particularly if you're an individual who's childish and vulnerable, you're just gonna pretend that everything was all right on your part because you don't want to acknowledge the reality of your actions, but that's how they managed it. I will say as well that the people who knew Smith, they did stand by her more. They put the blame on Brock Hill. So they said that as much as Smith may have been an imperfect parent, and also Smith definitely contributed to the death towards her daughter, she was more unlikely to have carried out the severe injuries that her daughter sustained. And a lot of them put the blame on Brock Hill per se. And I guess they could see a big slide in the behaviour around Smith and Star from when Brock Hill enters their life. And it's also worth noting that they did get CCTV footage and that CCTV footage actually captured some of Brock Hill's abuse to Star. So that in itself does support this assumption that whilst absolutely Smith is despicable in this case, she is. I am not going to stand outside of judgment in this moment because Smith had an option all the way through this, she chose herself over her child and she may not have been the person landing the blows, but she certain wasn't the one cushioning them either. And that's the issue because she wasn't protecting her child. She wasn't defending her child and she certainly wasn't preventing her child getting seriously injured. Anyway, in spite of the fact that we don't necessarily know exactly who did what, what we do know is that Smith did not turn to her family for help. Now, one of the reasons that she said that she didn't turn to her family for help again is representing the idea that she would have Star taken away from her. I don't really get that. I mean, her family would have protected her. Her family would have taken Star in. She wouldn't have been taken away. She might have been offered a safe place to stay, but also she additionalizes that with that she was scared of Brockhill. I think she was scared of Brockhill. I do. I think that Brockhill is a terrifying character, notoriously violent and so on and so forth. But still, what is an issue here is that her child was not at the centre of her concern. Because if we look at that, she was the centre of her concern. She didn't want Star taken away. She was scared of Brock Hill. So it's a very egocentric perspective. She's thinking about herself, not of the child. Because let's take that example and say, OK, maybe social services come in and take the child away. Why? You know, that's the question, isn't it? The why? It's not the removal of the child, it's the why would they have grounds for the removal of this child? If she's got to a point where she thinks that living with her child in Brockhill is so toxic, so terrifying, so destructive, so dangerous for her child, why would she not wish for that child to be made safe? She chooses her needs over her child's and that is unforgivable. Smith and Brockhill had the most toxic, volatile relationship you can imagine. And this is evidenced by, as in most cases these days, social media, because that's the thing, isn't it? Impulse control is something that lots of us struggle with. We've all done it in the moment, haven't we? Texted somebody something that was pretty nasty and then regretted it. It's not because we even feel it, it's because we feel it in the moment. But that means that we get to record these things in real time that can play out in the future. And there are lots of social media messages that have been dug up that show petty squabbles, jealous fights, usually under the influence of alcohol. Again, 
we all know how these kind of things can get out of control, are fueled when you're under the influence. And they were constantly splitting up, getting back together, splitting up, getting back together. And it seems that whenever Brock Hill got into a scenario where she felt jealous or angry or that their relationship was teetering on a breakdown, the immediacy for her was to take out her frustrations on Star. Put it into context what we're talking about here. We're talking about a well-built woman with a violent history, with a like of violence, and also trained in things like boxing. And she's attacking a baby. This is a child under the age of two years of age. She's physically abusing that child. And I'm not talking about a slap, even though I disagree wholeheartedly with ever raising a hand to your child. The point is I'm talking about high level violence. She was somebody who felt that she was really big and hard and tough, but she's slapping and punching a baby. I mean, if there's ever a description of a coward and a bully all in one, that's Brock Hill. Because one, a coward will be somebody who takes out their frustrations on an individual where they know there can be no repercussions in real time for them as far as they're concerned. Well, of course not. There's no way a child can equal you or defend themselves. So she's a coward there. And secondly, she's a bully because it's worked for her so far. Think about it. Her whole life has been bringing her to a point where she hasn't really had to pay very highly for any of the consequences of her behaviour. And that's a problem because she's actually got jobs because of it. There's a reinforcement as opposed to an aversion to these kind of behaviours. She's not really been served anything so catastrophic and consequential that it's made her rethink her position. But taking out your anger on a little baby. Also, want to note that Smith, so Smith, the person who claims that it was all Brock Hill, it's quoted that she was unnecessarily cruel to her daughter. And think about how old she is when I talk about this. She was known to impose punishments that were hideously harsh. And that was what she considered was naughty behaviour. And can we bring this into focus here? A child under two years of age is not naughty. They don't know what naughty is. They are just living their lives being kids. They haven't got the boundaries of adults, fortunately, because they're still living moment to moment. They don't know what good behaviour or bad behaviour is. They just know behaviour. And the fact that Smith starts believing that she is naughty isn't because she's naughty. It's because it permission bases the behaviour that Brock killing her dole out on that innocent kid. If you think about your mindset, when you act in a certain way, you have to make it in accordance to some degree with your conscience. Because if you don't, you're always going to feel terrible. If you're just hurting a child relentlessly and they don't deserve it, well, you'd have to be a sociopathic psychopath to not feel that conscience. But if you've got even a shred of conscience, you're going to be feeling bad. But if you're doling behaviour out on somebody who doesn't deserve it, that's going to make you feel terrible. So you create and fabricate this fantasy that actually the child is deserving of the punishment. So you don't have to feel that prick of conscience. And that seems to be what goes on here. To give you some examples, Star starts receiving some really awful punishments. And usually they're at the end of some kind of angry interaction between Brock Hill and Smith. So when they have fell out with each other, that's when they start doling out this kind of negative behaviour towards that poor child. And the irony is here that their arguments would soon be forgotten. They wouldn't have an impact on their lives, but it had a devastating impact on stars. And that's the selfishness about this story. That these two out of control young adults, they take out all their frustrations on this innocent child, they just get on with their lives. They have those bickering moments and get angry. But the violence that they show that kid, the cruelty they show that kid, is something that is catastrophic and long term. Now, on the 23rd of January 2020, we get the first person reporting their concerns to social services. And I want to make it clear here. I have studied a lot of cases and I've worked in a lot of cases where children have been at the hands of their parents or caregivers abused horribly, right? And often one of my big frustrations is that people around them must have known. You know, there were bruises, there was withdrawal behaviour, horrendous amounts of bedwetting, terrible thrush, things that kind of red flag you to the fact that there's something wrong with their home life. And you look and you think, why did nobody call social services? You know, why did nobody just take a risk? This case, is about as far away from that as I can describe. Because wow, 
people were so concerned and they were repeatedly letting social services know. As I said earlier on, one of the reasons that Star used to be able to go out drinking all the time with her mum is because she had a babysitter called Holly Jones. And Holly Jones had regularly looked after Star while Smith was on these drinking sessions. In fact, one of the things that Holly Jones, who I personally think is a hero, I genuinely do, she even would take Star back to her house. Why? Because she felt like Star was safe there. That woman, she raised the alarm on numerous times. I cannot imagine what social services have done to this woman's life. She saw and she took action and the courage and bravery to do that in spite of knowing that Smith is with some kind of violent nightmare of a partner who could do her damage. She chose Star. You see, that's what's meant to happen in life, isn't it? We choose the child even when it's really difficult. I've had a really strong conversation with somebody recently whose own partner is violent towards their children and social services have got involved and they didn't know how to handle it. They didn't know whether to confirm it with social services or not. And I said, you don't have a choice. You have to, because you either stand by your child or you stand by your partner and one will do long-term damage and one will heal the situation potentially. And that's what they've chosen to do. It's not that I underestimate the gravity of having to make decisions like that. It's really challenging. But I'm saying there isn't a choice to make. The child is paramount. They don't have a voice. They can't speak for themselves. You have to speak for them. And this woman, that's all she does. She speaks for Star and she does it repeatedly. And she's ignored repeatedly. And when she reflects on these occasions, she actually said that on one occasion, Smith was actually told by social services they'd be visiting. So <laughs> this is mind blowing. You've got a child who's potentially being horrifically abused by the parents. And the aim of making sure that child is safe is to make sure that when you turn up, they're not ready for you to turn up. Because if you turn up having informed them, then what are the chances? Well, they're gonna tidy the house. They're gonna sort it out to make it look like they're great parents. That's what they do. These are manipulative people. If you've got nothing to hide, you can turn up any time, right? But no, social services call Smith and tell them that they're gonna visit. She spent an hour cleaning, then she covered up the bruises on Star. So they informed her that they were gonna come so she was informed enough to sort things out so she could cover it all up. Also, when social services visited, she actually held on to Star because she wanted to obscure the view of Star's bruises from social workers. And social workers went round, had a chat and called Holly and said Star was safe. Everything looked fine. There was nothing more that they could do. And believe me, if that angers you, we haven't even started yet. So Holly would later state, they'd rung an hour before saying they were coming which I thought was really stupid. It's like ringing up a criminal and saying, I'm coming to get you. And she is absolutely bang on. That's exactly what went on there. They gave Smith and Brockhill the perfect opportunity to cover up their crimes. And then they believed them. And then they told the woman who had spent months and months of her life looking after and protecting this child that she was the one who was wrong. Now, in February 2020, Star's great-grandparents, her own great-grandparents, Annetta and David, they take in Star for 10 weeks. And this is because basically Smith is struggling to cope after yet again breaking up with Brockhill. So note why I don't believe that she really wanted to leave. Because why is she struggling after breaking up with her? If it's such a toxic, terrible situation you just don't want to be involved in, she's got the perfect opportunity now, yeah? So she hands over Star to her great-grandparents. At first, her great-grandparents say, look, there was something really off. Star seemed depressed. And at this point, she's nine months old and she can appear depressed. And actually, that's reality. A neglected child will seem totally depressed. Forget the fact that they're also violent towards her, so the world is a scary place. It's the fact that there's no interaction. If a child isn't being loved, isn't feeling safe, then their mood is very, very low. Also, she had a terrible nappy rash classic sign of neglect, but genuinely, because she got returned to Annetta and David, she started to really thrive. 
So they have loads of photos and video clips. She's laughing, she's smiling, she's really playful. Also, she gained weight, so she wasn't being fed properly. And it was noted by everybody who met Star in that time. She's miles happier, miles healthier. And David actually stated later, Star was just looking at the floor all the time. Her hair looked sort of unkempt and she had a really bad nappy rash. So Anita had to sort it all out and she cleaned her up. And within about two days, she started coming out of herself and she was a proper little character. So we see this complete transition from this depressed, helpless, neglected state to being a child who feels safe. Isn't it amazing how such a short period of time with good human beings can make all the difference? So while Star was with her great-grandparents, at this point, Smith doesn't really take time to work on her relationship or herself. She just uses it as an opportunity to go out. So again, she's out drinking with her mother constantly. Now again, what's really, really sad about this case is that's where it should end. Star was in a good place. She was safe, nurtured, loved, cared for, and that family would have kept her. And it was the right place for that child to be. I'm not saying that Smith shouldn't have a relationship with a daughter. She should have, we always want to encourage that. But she was not fit, she was not right to look after that child. And if she had just had the capacity to be compassionate enough to her child's needs, she would have left her there. But she wasn't compassionate to her child's needs. So she collects Star in April and I will tell you, the neighbours said the day that Star was collected, she became hysterical. They used the words she was screaming and terrified as she left her great-grandparents. And that in itself breaks my heart. The fact that people who witnessed the separation of her great-grandparents and Star saw the terror in her eyes, the terror in her voice. And let's all think about this. This is a nine-month-old child. And for all those people out there who think that children of this age don't really know how to react in the world, they haven't really identified with fear, it's not true. We are all constantly dealing with fear from the very beginning of our life. And yes, we learn by growing in courage that we can manage a stronger resilience to the world, but it begins day one. And that child, even at nine months of age, knew where she was safe. And even though she'd had this separation period between her and her mother, the minute that her mum comes, as opposed to being gleeful and happy and thrilled that she's gonna be around her mother, she's absolutely mortified. And for good reason. So Star, even at nine months of age, is able to understand what a safe place is and who a safe place is. It's as simple as that. And that is just utterly heartbreaking for all of us, I know. So Smith takes a black to a flat in Wesley Place, Halifax Road, Keithley. And of course, this means that she's now at the mercy of this cruel, self-absorbed mother and her horribly violent partner who is frequently visiting and staying. And then of course, lockdown. Now, I've done this before. I can't help myself. Lockdown is terrible. If you've watched my Arthur Lambin Joe Hughes video, you will know my feelings about lockdown. But again, in case you haven't seen that, I'm just gonna state it again. Domestic homicides have over doubled since lockdown because stress aggravates already violent people. And even people with violence that is latent can often have it activated through periods of stress. Therefore, people die. Also, major increase in head injuries at hospitals of children and child mortality also has massively increased. We are not doing well because of these lockdowns. I know that everybody's got their own opinions, but let's forget any of the other issues and let's just bring it down to, is lockdown good for children and is it good for partnerships? No, it's not, it's terrible and it can result in some catastrophic events. And STAR is another example of what happens when we lock children up with their abusers and there is no support around them because legally it's enforced that you can't have. That in itself is a contributing factor here. And that's what we have to look at when we think about how we make things better. How do we stop these contributing factors? And at a point where the government in the UK is seriously considering doing it again, everybody listening to me right now, if you genuinely care about children, if you genuinely want to prevent child murder, if you genuinely want to increase safeguarding of kids, if you genuinely want to hold services to account for their lack of actions leading to children dying, then you have to be against lockdowns for no other reason than it's contributing to child murder and to partner murder. 
And that in itself should be something that is enough to say there has to be a better way. I don't want to be doing more cases like Star and Arthur. I want children safe in their homes. And if they're not safe in their homes, God, I want people to be able to see that by schools noticing, by family members noticing. And that can only occur when children have access to those other support strategies around them. On the 14th of March, 2020, Brock Hill punched Smith in the face at the Sun pub. She then later claims it's an accident. But again, I'm bringing that in because if you're somebody who does something like that in public, what are you doing behind closed doors? Abusers are often very calculating and manipulative. They do things behind closed doors so that no one can call them into account. If they're doing it publicly, wow, very poor impulse control, low motivation regarding being pro-social and not concerned about witnesses. Also, the fact that she says it's an accident shows that she thinks that she can get away with things. And also, that it's highly likely Smith will just agree it was. So that control is playing out, isn't it? Now, on the 15th of March, 2020, so of course, this is a week and a half before lockdown begins, essentially, Brockkill texts a sparring partner of hers, so a boxing sparring partner, and says that she tried to kill herself and Smith by driving off a cliff. Number one, no, you didn't, because you didn't drive off a cliff. I mean, you may have thought about driving off a cliff. You may even have said you were going to drive off a cliff, but you don't try to drive off a cliff to kill yourself, but not drive off the cliff. Understandably, if you'd driven off the cliff to try to kill her and you, and the car had crashed and you'd survived, I'll give you, you'd tried to kill her and you by driving off a cliff. But this is just, again, the realms of fantasy, but nonetheless demonstrates this willingness to do whatever it takes to deal with these internal emotions of crisis that she feels. Anyway, her explanation is, she didn't go ahead and do that. Instead, she gave Smith a hiding instead. She also texts and says that she feels that she's out of control and that she needs help. And that should have given her an insight to actually go and get some. But no, she's very good at expressing these thoughts, but she's not good at actually dealing with them or doing something constructive to manage them. Now, Smith and Brockkill's relationship escalate in violence and it becomes very volatile from May and Star is in the middle of all of this. And remember, this is the point where, you know, lockdowns happened and restrictions are everywhere and services have closed down a great deal. People are off isolating and all and everything in between that adds to this whole mess of what Star is experiencing. Now, Annette and David, as we all know, massively loving great grandparents. They are really concerned. This is a week after Star has left their care. They begin to become really concerned about what's happening to Star relatives told them and this is going to be hard to hear guys Brockhill was basically choke slamming star and throwing her on the bed now a choke slam if you don't know wrestling is a wrestling move where you lift a person off the ground by the neck and you slam them to the ground on the back this is a baby she's choke slamming that child and what is going through her head that she's doing that and imagine the catastrophic damage that can occur for a child during those kind of moments. Also, this is something she really enjoyed doing. She'd pick her up by one leg and she'd hold her over a cot. I mean, the level of power and control that she exerts over that baby is unbelievable. And just the knowing that that child would be dangling there it's very uncomfortable anyway. It's incredibly scary because somebody's got entire control over your body. And of course, it's painful. She also said that she wanted to shave her hair off to make her like a little gypsy baby in her own image. So again, this power play, this ownership, as far as she is concerned, Star is there for her to do what she wishes with. On the 5th of May, obviously, Annetta and David have heard all of this, so Annetta contacts Bradford Council Social Services and reports their concerns. Again, this would be the first of repeated attempts by the family to get help. And she actually says on the phone, did they want another baby pee? And you know what they said? They said, what does she mean by that? You know, imagine calling social services and saying, I am concerned that my great grandchild may become a victim like baby pee. And they say, what do you mean by that? Well, number one, you need to do your historical research as to who baby pee is because you should know it should be literally tattooed into your brain. 
If you work in social services, it should be tattooed into your brain. The same as Victoria Clumbay. I know these names, not because I've researched them, because I literally know them from the original events. I read the reports, I learned what went on, and I recognised the changes that needed to take place in everybody's practice to prevent this kind of stuff happening again. To even go, what do you mean? Well, I mean that the child may end up dead, tortured, unnecessary victim of yet another domestically violent scenario that you're meant to prevent. And if I sound angry, I am, because it gets worse. No one visits them to discuss any of the concerns in spite of this call, in spite of the fact there's been previous calls. Also, social services did not even confirm with them that they closed the case. So the family are thinking this is going to get investigated, but actually social services have closed the case. And Annette later told a family friend, I'm worried our star is going to end up dead. So Annetta was absolutely horrified at the potential that that child was in such grave danger that she may well end up a baby pee and how right she was. Now, social services did visit Smith following this referral, but she and Brock Hill were just able to manipulate the situation. They fooled them. Uh, basically, this was a recurring theme throughout the investigations. They always had excuses to explain away any marks and bruises. In fact, they would claim that Star had injured herself playing. On one occasion, they justified all this multiple bruising to her legs by claiming that she'd fallen downstairs. And the social workers believe them. Now, one of the reasons that I think they were swayed by this was because Brockkill manipulated the situation by saying the reason that the family was so against Brockkill and Smith was because Smith's family disapproved of the same-sex relationship and because of the gypsy heritage, this was an issue that they tried to create problems because they just didn't like their lifestyle. Now, Smith's great-grandmother later on was like, that's absolutely ludicrous. I have lots of people who are friends in same-sex relationships. I've got friends who are gypsies. I'm just concerned about Star's welfare. So in spite of the fact that these kind of lies are being made up by Brock Hill, a quick conversation with the great-grandparents would have explained away any of the concerns that social services had about these being malicious attacks on Smith and Brock Hill. But no, they don't do that. And this is what worries me. This is what worries me about the way our society is moving. It's like, if people have a certain lifestyle, people now feel that if they question the way that they are towards people around them, that somehow they're gonna be phobic by some standard. It's ridiculous. You are not homophobic because you don't want a child to get injured. You are not racist because you don't want a child to get injured. You are concerned for their welfare. But again, social services just go down on the side of the parent and the girlfriend. And that is terrifying for me to hear. And let me show you, the bruises in that video that I've put out there are devastating, aren't they? You can see how dangerous a situation Star was in. Now, David, the great-grandfather, has actually said social services were shambolic. Their word, not mine, shambolic. So social services and the police again visit in May, June and September. Now, let me tell you, <laughs> if social services are being informed consistently by different parties and they're going around and they're not escalating this to a serious issue, that is a failing beyond belief. Now, Brock Hill actually spoke to social services twice. The second time, she gave permission for them to do a police background check on her. This is standard. They obviously want to know whether there's any violence in history. But it's irrelevant because lots of people are not criminalised and are highly violent. As far as I'm concerned, and certainly I think the reports that are coming out and definitely the investigation that will take place have found that the authorities missed obvious signs of abuse. Obvious signs of abuse. Now, the last occasion that they actually went out and saw Star was three weeks before her death. Three weeks. No action was taken. In fact, the people who reported the concerns, that was family and non-family members, they were completely excluded from the process. These people trying to protect this child, the voice of this child, the opportunity for Star to actually be heard through people who loved her, totally dismissed. And in total, five different people, five different people expressed concerns about Star to authorities. That's five opportunities that authorities had to save her, all missed. And like I said, let's go for one person's malicious. That can happen. 
There have been situations and scenarios where somebody has rang social services maliciously and it's untrue, and they can do that several times. And in the end, social services will rightly ignore that person. If you have five different sources saying that Star is in danger and you do nothing about it, you are complicit. And believe me, as I tell this story, social services are complicit in this child's death. That's what I believe. And I believe that at the end of this, you'll feel exactly the same. Now, tragically, the consequences of the family reports to social services also meant that the reaction by Brock Hill and Smith was to immediately cut access to Star. So not only now have they been silenced by social services, not only have Star and Brock Hill been validated by social services, thus giving them more permission to carry out these hideous attacks, also the very support that Star desperately needed to be around her extended family who love her was cut off. And actually, probably the worst impacted were Annetta and David, the great grandparents. They only saw Star on two more occasions after that. Now, I'm not sure whether this was Smith's decision alone. You know, maybe she was afraid of losing Star, so she cut that contact. But there's a likelihood as well it could have been ordered by Brock Hill. We'll never know, but certainly the dynamics here are incredibly problematic for Star. Later, as I said, they blame each other. Brock Hill would actually advise that it was social services who said that they should limit the contact with Star's extended family because it was a malicious complaint. And I know she's a liar. I know she's a violent thug. I know she's a murderer. But I don't think that she would lie about that. I think that probably that was what happened. That the social workers convinced that this was a nice couple who were just being attacked because of their sexuality and their background, that somehow it would be good measure to avoid having any relationships with these malicious people who seem to have it in for them. But that is so misguided. It is absolutely unbelievable because firstly, it makes the extended family and the complainants the guilty party. And secondly, even if they are guilty of, let's say, some malicious complaints, which wouldn't be nice, how does that mean that they shouldn't have a relationship that has been loving with a child that they have been good for? That a child has been left for 10 weeks recently with and has thrived? You should always want to keep contact with family members who are good for the child. So it's massively, massively problematic to hear that. And I think it's probably true and it's unbelievable. Now, not only did social services miss the signs of abuse, somehow going in there, they managed to make matters worse. They helped to isolate Star from a loving, caring support network. And again, it's unforgivable. This case has tragic echoes for me of the recent six-year-old Arthur Labinjo Hughes murder. If you've not seen that, there is a video on it. And let me tell you, if you feel angry about this case, well, you're not gonna feel any more soothed by watching that one. In that case, the biological parent was obsessed with the violent, abusive partner. They were easily manipulated by her. They colluded in the abuse with her. And the child was basically taken from a really safe, loving environment of extended family members to a loveless, neglectful, and abusive environment during the UK lockdown. And he was subjected to horrific punishments and physical attacks. And the injuries were covered up with continual lies and there were multiple opportunities to save them and Arthur was failed horribly. All of them were missed and he ended up dead. Likewise, Star was subjected to a life of punishment and abuse between May and September. And due to the deterioration of the relationship between Brock Hill and Smith, the aggression starts building. And actually, Brock Hill starts secretly recording Smith's behavior during arguments. Now that is one-sided, isn't it? I always say that because it's amazing how in arguments, it's only one party who seems to be going completely out of control. But of course, if the person's recording them, that's because they are maintaining control to make the other party look bad. But clearly there are big problems with Smith as well. And in one of the recordings, there's a reference to Smith holding Star's head underwater in the bath. So that's actually recorded. They're acknowledging that this has happened. And apparently holding her head under the water in the bath was a punishment for crying, for crying. A natural communication that a child has with the parent to let the parent know that they are struggling, frustrated, upset, hungry, scared. It is a hardwired reaction to letting the parent know they are in some kind of pain. Emotional, physical, social, psychological, some kind of pain and for that, she gets put underwater. 
which would be terrifying for that little girl. Brockhill also stated that she accused Smith of squeezing Starr's hands and bending her fingers back. Again, that's her own mother. Squeezing her hands and bending her fingers back. I think we can all agree that is incredibly painful, but also, wow, the malice. Imagine doing that to your child. To actually physically aggress them that way. Not just the squeezing, which is bad enough, but the bending fingers back. Agony for a child. Terrifying to imagine the primary caregiver doing that to them. Now, of course, Brockhill is constantly violent as she continues to inflict really serious assaults on Star. And as I said earlier on, she had this particular favourite technique and that was to hold her over her cot by one leg. She would also twist her legs between her hands. This is a strong woman twisting a child's legs between her hands. And even though it could never be proven that Brockhill had actually done this injury, Star did have two fractures to her right shin bone. They were never treated. And when Star screamed because of the pain, Brockhill accused her of just being hysterical. See how these apparent adults are using similar adult ideas to project onto a child, like you are hysterical, you are not able to cope, you are the problem. This is like being in a relationship with another adult where you believe that they are in a position where they have the wherewithal to manage their emotions. This is not how you deal with a child. A child is reactive to what's happening. And horribly injured, when she responds to that, she's just blamed more. This little girl, this innocent, little, defenceless child. Also, it's really ironic because whilst all this is going on, Smith is trying to portray this idyllic life on social media. So on Facebook, you know, it looks like they're a really happy family, but the truth is, there are far more sinister things going on beneath the surface. And one of the things that they would do, which I find deeply disturbing, reprehensible, and absolutely fear-inducing, is that they took loads of videos of her being punished. I mean, punishing a child I struggle with in lots of circumstances, because I often think that what you're doing is you're punishing the child because you're struggling. I think you need to give yourself time out, not the child. But to take it further and to want to video your child in pain. So they've got a video crying, standing, facing a wall. And the punishments were for nothing more than just normal childish antics. In one video, Star is sitting absolutely exhausted in this green plastic chair. She's obviously been there a long while and she looks completely broken. Both Smith and Brockhill filmed her from different angles. And eventually, because she's so exhausted, she drifts off and she falls out of the chair and she lands on the top of her head, dangerously on the floor. Now, if that happens to pretty much anyone's child, it doesn't even have to be yours. What's the normal reaction? One, you throw yourself off across the room when you try to prevent it happening. Two, if it happens, you're absolutely horrified because your child has been damaged or somebody's child has been damaged. Three, you comfort them and think, do I need medical attention? That's what happens in pretty much 99.999% of people's reactions. But instead of that, instead of helping her, instead of comforting her, they find it funny. And not just funny in the moment, no. They have time to reflect on this and it's so much fun that they've actually captured this, that Brockhill edits a slow motion footage and adds dramatic music. Then she sends it to friends with the message, fucked it, followed by three crying emojis with laughter. Can you imagine that? Three crying with laughter emojis were put on to that as well. Now she said later on, well, that wasn't anything sinister. It was just funny. It's just what you'd have seen on You've Been Framed. No, it isn't. No, it isn't what you see on You've Been Framed. Because on You've Been Framed, it's not meant to happen. In your house, you created that situation. You left her in a chair, completely exhausted, to a point where you waited for her to fall off the chair. And then you thought it was funny enough to share with your mates, you sadistic, sadistic tosser. On another occasion, they film her desperately in need of sleep. So this sleep deprivation is a part of their abuse. And because she's so exhausted, she eventually falls forward face first into her bowl of food. Other footage showed her being tearful. And one particular horrific video 
shows a very badly injured star crawling up a flight of stairs to Smith's flat. Her untreated legs are still broken. And rather than helping her, Brockhill just filmed her. When Star actually gets up to the flat, she wasn't even greeted by her mother. Smith just continued to make her walk, so continued her agony. Oh, it makes me so angry talking about this. Sometimes it's hard when you're doing a video because you're like aware that this is actually real. You know, I'm giving you the facts and I'm giving you the experiences of that child, but this is real. This actually happened and this happened really recently. And this is an experience of a little girl. And it's kind of quite overwhelming, isn't it? When you start thinking of it like that, we are talking about this gorgeous, innocent, defenseless child. And I am telling you the facts around her horrific abuse and murder. And it's just moments where I'm like, wow, it's really important for us all to just hold on to that. This isn't me talking about a true crime and just delivering the facts and the story. This is me kind of trying to get it across of just how horrific the failings are in this case and what that little girl faced. What that little girl faced. Walking on a broken leg, being made to sit exhausted to a point where she falls out of a chair and injures herself just being laughed at and made into jokes on social media. Horrible. In June, there was a rare occasion where Star's family actually did see her. She got an enormous bruise covering her cheek. I mean, wow, one look at that bruise on her cheek, I would have had her removed from home. I'm telling you now, any social worker who saw that kind of bruising on her cheek, remove that child because I am telling you, that is a deep bruise. It's not a contact bruise. It's not like she's hit something quickly. It's not like she's fell into something. It's a deep contact groove. It's multi-layered. You can see it. At this point, they make another referral to social services. And with respect, as a result, the police do take Star to hospital to be checked over by a paediatrician. Now, again, I don't know why they do this. Because it's like, why question the potential abusers about the injury? They're not going to be like, yeah, I did it. I kicked her in the face. I mean, it's just so obvious, isn't it? Where is the historical gathering of evidence about all the occasions they've been out? But when Brockwell is questioned, and why the hell she's even questioned? Because really, she's the partner of the girl's mother. That should be kind of irrelevant to this. Smith should be being questioned about this. But she says Star was basically playing in the living room. In the centre of the room is a mirrored coffee table, and the drawer has a round crystal ball as the handle. She was playing with puppies but she was still unsteady on her feet at this point. She was running and she fell into the table. They're her words. I would have been like, huh, too much detail there. You've even thought about the shape of the thing that she went into. This sounds a little bit constructed, but they didn't. And she even complains to the paediatrician that Smith's family had made the referral without asking them how it had been caused and would later state, I was scared Star would be removed from Frankie and put into care and we wouldn't see her anymore. I was scared for Frankie and Star, not myself. I loved Star to bits. No, you didn't, you great, big, abusive, murdering liar. No, you didn't. Don't you even put I loved Star in a sentence. You do not deserve to utter those words and it was not true. Full stop. It blows my mind right now that I am telling this story at a point where authorities have been involved and they did not connect the dots. They didn't look at the obvious reports from the people inside and outside the family. They didn't look at the consistent injuries on the child. They just accepted the constant excuses from the alleged abusers. What the hell is going on here? What the hell? July the 20th to the 21st, 2020. Stars basically left overnight in Brockhill's sole care. Again, grossly negligent of Smith. She knows how dangerous Brockhill is to her daughter. She knows that Brockhill takes great delight in abusing her and she just goes out drinking. So she leaves her with her potential abuser and with her eventual murderer. Now Brockhill's caught on CCTV carrying Star to her vehicle, okay? And at this point on the CCTV, no obvious signs of bruising. Sure, there'll have been some, but it's not obvious. Photographs of Star later that night show this large bruise on her right cheek. And that's definitely going to have been caused by Brockhill, slapping her very hard. Now, the same night, 
Rockhill googled what takes bruising and swelling down and what takes bruising down quickly. So it's not like she's not aware of what she's doing. And it's not like she doesn't understand the impact of what she's doing. What she's trying to do is cover it up. So she's very, very aware of what's happening here and that she shouldn't be doing it. Otherwise, she wouldn't care. So the very fact that she's trying to cover it up shows you she understands what her actions are doing. She's fully culpable. She's not out of control. She's manipulative. Now, the weekend of the 12th and 13th of September 2020, Star again is in Brockhill's Soul Care. Smith's out drinking again. Now, she takes Star to a recycling plant where she works, and during a three-hour period, she's captured on CCTV physically abusing her in a vehicle. And in that three-hour period, she inflicted a total of 21 blows and punches to that little girl. And those blows and punches and slaps, they were noted as to have considerable force. That was many times while Star was in the car seat, so she couldn't even move. She was just absolutely a helpless victim. Also, she's seen grabbing her throat. At one point, she actually struck her with such force that Star fell out of the vehicle. She fell out of the vehicle. Now, of course, Brockhill's got an excuse to this. She said that just sudden movements towards Star were her hand slipping or her trying to entertain Star by punching her in the face, by pushing her out of the car. I mean, Brockhill, you really have very few brain cells in this situation, don't you? Because anybody with an ounce of integrity and intelligence can see that you are lying through your teeth. Now, when she was returned to Smith, Star's face was really badly bruised. Her nose was scratched. She had bruising on her hands and arms. And Smith texted Brockhill, the marks on this baby is ridiculous. Sorry? The marks on this baby is ridiculous. Can you see what she does there? She doesn't care about the marks on the baby. She just thinks they're ridiculous because people will be able to see them. She's not concerned about the, what the hell have you done to my child, you absolutely psychopathic lunatic. I need you locked up. No, all she's concerned about is the baby is marked and that is gonna indicate that there are problems at the home and she doesn't want that. She doesn't want social services being involved. So the way that she's dealing with this is in anger, not for the injuries, but for the fact that the injuries are visible. So she knows who's caused them and she's still allowing Brockhill in her life. Now Brockhill Googled later that night, in fact, can you die from being winded? And what happens when you get winded? She knew exactly what she'd done. She knew the force that she'd used and she was worried about the level of force that she'd used. On the 20th of September, Brockhill's caught on CCTV dragging Star through Bradford City Centre on her reins. And it's devastating. The Star's head is just dropping to one side. It's just awful to think at this moment in time of what kind of injuries that she is carrying. She must have been in absolute agony. Absolute agony. On the 22nd of September 2020, Brockhill arrives at Smith's flat. And at some point, as ever, Smith just leaves her alone, unsupervised with Star. And it's later that day, emergency services receive a call from Brockhill and she claims Star and two other children have been playing, she'd heard a bang, she enters the room and of course she finds Star on the floor. She said she was crying. She sat her up and rubbed her back, trying to suggest that she's a good caregiver. She then says that Star is sick and that it seems like she's struggling to breathe. She says that she's put her in the recovery position and that she's performed CPR on her, but that now she is sort of floppy. Now, a few problems there. One, do you know that her heart has stopped? Why are you doing CPR? Because you've said that she was struggling to breathe, but you haven't suggested that her heart has stopped. And secondly, she's now dealing with a child who's apparently floppy. But there seems to be some inconsistencies in that story, doesn't there? And also, what kind of a catastrophic injury has occurred that she can fall over and hurt herself so badly? Paramedics, as ever you'd imagine, get there quickly, and it's horrific for them. Star is lifeless, she's pale, she's wearing just a nappy, and she's in cardiac arrest. Now, the paramedics attempt CPR, and at this point, Star basically vomits this really large amount of brown material. Brock kills all the while trying to persuade the paramedics that, you know, maybe, maybe, the way that she did CPR could have injured Star because she was performing CPR on her abdomen rather than her chest. Can you see how this is? So now, 
apparently, even though Brock Hill reckons that she's some kind of first aid superstar who was going to do CPR, she's trying to cover up the injury that's occurred. Remember, she's been Googling winded to suggest that she's actually damaged Star during her attempts to save her. Now, I don't know about you or me, guys, but certainly for me, if somebody says, I've done CPR on somebody's abdomen, I'm going to be like, you're lying. No one in the history of human experience has done CPR on an abdomen. It's a bit like saying somebody was choking to death and I gave them the high maneuver and I did it on their legs. It wasn't effective. Tripped them up, broke the nose. You know what I mean? You know it's just absolute lies. So we can also acknowledge that she was definitely guilty for that blow. Star gets airlifted to hospital. And let me tell you, it's very quickly. The medical services say these injuries are completely unsurvivable. That little girl suffered fatal catastrophic injuries that were likened to a car crash victim. And that happened in her home. The postmortem established that she had been repeatedly physically assaulted during the last months of her life. She had 38 existing separate external injuries, bruises, cuts, swellings. They included 10 bruises to her legs, ankles, feet and toes. She had two rib fractures that were two to four weeks old. She had an aftermath of earlier damage to her internal organs. She had two breaks to her right shin bone, which were caused by forceful twisting. And actually the bone had begun to heal and it had been refractured. So she'd broken it and then had it broken again. This is what they've done to her. Imagine doing that. You've already caused one break and then you go ahead and cause another one to this defenseless child. And this is why Star was actually limping in the weeks leading up to her death. She also had a 12 centimetre long series of fractures to the back of her skull, which was considered to be like crazy paving. That's how they described it. This kid's back of the skull was like crazy paving. She had 15 injuries to her head alone, separate injuries. And those injuries had been inflicted just days before she died and had resulted in two brain injuries. I can't even begin to imagine the pain that that kid was in in her final weeks. However, in spite of all those being catastrophic and hideous enough to describe the worst injury, it was a two centimetre by two centimetre laceration to her inferior vena cava. For those of you who don't know, that's the largest vein in the body. It's the main blood vessel carrying blood between your leg and your organs. And that blood from her ruptured vein leaked into her abdominal cavity. Almost half of her blood in her body leaked into her abdomen. She effectively bled to death internally. There was nothing that doctors could have done. Nothing could have saved her. And they said that those fatal blows had been inflicted by punches, stamps or kicks. It also injured other organs, including her liver, which was split, her bruised pancreas, kidney damage, bruising to her lungs, tear to the fatty attachments of her bowel, and it would turn out after inflicting the final fatal assault that Brock Hill waited 11 minutes before calling emergency services. In the meantime, she Googled home remedies for horrific injuries she'd inflicted. She Googled shock in babies. The massive internal bleeding would have caused a catastrophic drop in her blood pressure and that would have led to unconsciousness and death within seconds to minutes. Horrific. I mean, I don't even know where to go with all of that list. I really don't. And I'm sorry for sharing it with you, but I have to, because if you don't understand what this little girl suffered and you don't understand the failings that occurred to create this absolute unnecessary loss of life, then I've not done my job. When the police bring Brock in to question, she basically maintains that she and Smith hadn't even been in the room at the time of the incident. So she hadn't been in the living room at the time of the incident. Again, bit of a problem, Brock Hill. You're meant to be looking after a young child. Why wouldn't you be in a living room with them if they could become so catastrophically damaged? So on a safeguarding level, that's neglectful anyway. And Smith, of course, peddles out the same story. They've obviously convinced that they can get away with this. They've talked about it between each other. They've tried to create a situation where they've got an alibi that this isn't their fault. Brock Hill then said that the two-year-old child must have inflicted the fatal injury on Star. So the kids that she's playing with, yeah, basically a two-year-old child managed to do it. Is it just me? Is it just me? I mean, sorry Brock Hill, you're suggesting that a 
two year old, a 24 month old child could literally cause an injury so gratuitous that the child that they'd attacked bled out internally to a point where they could not be saved. You're saying that they did that and that created a crazy paving kind of injury to her skull. But you can see that Brock Hill believes that this story is something that's potentially going to exonerate her from being considered a guilty party. Now, understandably, medics later state that the force that was used on that little girl was so great, so catastrophic, that it was impossible for it to have been inflicted by a child. Impossible. Absolutely no possibility that that could ever have occurred. So it wasn't just a, well, a maybe, or I guess in certain circumstances, it was a black and white, there is not a chance in hell that a kid could do this. Brock Hill and Smith at this point are charged with Starr's murder. And as you will know, if you followed this case, both pleaded guilty. They said, it was absolutely our fault. We are terrible human beings. We deserve to be caught. We are bang to rights. It's as simple as that. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. That's not what happened. Is it ever? Is it ever what happens in these cases that these people are brought in and they actually have the honesty, integrity, realisation and remorse to say, I'm guilty? No. Classic. They say they're not guilty. Now, one of the things that occurs, like it did with the Arthur Lambin Joe Hughes case, is that there is extensive media coverage and social media activities also go through the roof. And with respect, this leads to attacks on Brock Hill's family. And um, Brock Hill's sister is subjected to a very violent assault. Another relative suffered a fractured skull. Other members were subjected to violent threats and intimidation, and that is reprehensible. I appreciate that Brock Hill's been formed. I appreciate that she's a horrible human being with a complete interest in violence, intimidation and bullying, and that she's an abusive and murderous woman. But her family shouldn't be being beaten up because of this. They didn't do it. And in fact, anybody who thinks that there is a righteous beating up of relatives of this individual basically has more aligned with Brock Hill than they do in the protection of Star. It's not what we do. I understand that situations provoke feelings that are very, very challenging, but to then go and take them out on innocent parties just isn't an acceptable thing to do. Now, there's a further tragic twist to this story because in June 2020, this is while Smith's being investigated in relation to Starr's death, her father, 50-year-old Andrew Smith, took his own life. He killed himself. Couldn't live with the realisation of what his daughter had done. He actually took an overdose. And the reason that we know that he did it because of this specifically is he sent a note to Smith in custody on her birthday and he told her to look after herself and that he'd look after the baby. And it is heartbreaking that, isn't it? And I can kind of really understand it. No one wants to take their own life. Obviously you're in terrible pain when you do, but often one of the most challenging things when you take your own life is this idea of what's next to some degree. But when you feel really depressed and you've got this idea that actually you're going to be able to go and be with this child who's currently on her own after being so horribly abused, it kind of motivates you, doesn't it? And I think that's what he did. He felt motivated to actually leave this earth because of the terrible feelings he was managing himself and the pain he was dealing with within the grief, but also because he felt that he was a guardian and that he could go and be a guardian of Star in the afterlife. And I genuinely hope that's true. I really do. I have strong beliefs and I do believe that potentially that is what's happened. Andrew's father, Frank, well, he was one of the family members to report concerns about his great granddaughter to social services. And he said that his son had had a handprint of stars on his window and he'd never washed it off. He just kept it there. Frank told the media when they found him, Star's coat was at the side of him. My son did what he did and had 50 years of life. That baby only had a few months. I think that's a really beautiful way of characterising how he feels. He's saying that, yeah, he's lost his son and that's terrible, but his son had 50 years and also made a choice to take his life. Whereas that little baby had months and had no choice in hers being removed. Now, two days before the trial, Brock Hill actually nearly dies. So she's found collapsed face down at Style Prison and she's had seizures 
throughout her life. But in this case, she had a seizure which lasted one hour and 20 minutes, so very, very dangerous. She needed CPR, and she actually had a three further seizures and two cardiac arrests while she was in medical care. Apparently, she's got a degenerative disc disease, and she's suffered seizures since being a teen. But one can argue that this must show that she was facing a high level of stress, and rightfully so. I don't have any feelings of sadness for that, you know, she's the one who's created this stressful situation, she's the one who's murdered a defenceless child, but it notes that she's obviously having an emotional reaction to that. And that's interesting because, you know, somebody like this seems so devoid of any emotion that there must be at least self-interest and self-regard to a high level there that she's so concerned about her own well-being that she becomes so stressed she actually makes herself ill. Now at the court, Bradford Crown Court, the prosecutors have to describe the injuries that caused Star's death. As I've said, she had extensive damage to the abdominal cavity, and that was caused by a severe and forceful blow or blows, either in the form of punching, stamping, or kicking to the abdomen. They said the assault or assaults that killed Star clearly involved the use of severe force and were obviously intentional. This little girl suffered no accidental death. Now, during the trial, Smith put all the blame on Brockhill. She claimed that she was dominated by her, she was so fearful of her that she was unable to even ask for help or leave, and that she was really unaware of the seriousness of assaults Brockhill was inflicting on her daughter. Bear in mind what I told you earlier on about their Snapchats and their text messages between one another. Now the prosecution straight away were like, that is not the case. As far as they were concerned, there was evidence to say Smith wanted to be with Brockhill, also that she could actually be as physically threatening in arguments because of the secret recordings that Brockhill made during the argument. They played that in court. And Smith could actually be heard threatening to murder and strangle the life out of her. So hardly a wallflower, so to speak, you know? Clearly somebody who is quite happy to also threaten violence. And also she said that she hadn't had anybody that she could turn to, and that's not true because she had lots of people to turn to. And she did know what Brockhill was doing to her daughter because she even Googled how to get an injunction. So she was kind of equipping herself to think, well, okay, how do I deal with this if I want to get out? She allowed the abuse to happen. She colluded with it. She was a co-conspirator in that way. Now, Brockhill claimed that the decision to cut the extended family's access to Star, which we'd seen happen just after the social services had got involved, arguably, as Brockhill had said, social services advised it, but then she also additionalises that stance and says, actually, it was Smith who decided that Star wasn't able to see the extended family and that she just supported it. She also claimed that Smith was behaving more and more violently towards her from May onwards. But this is just that he said, she said situation, isn't it? Just trying to put the blame on the other party. And one of the things that was noted by people who watched that trial and were involved in it is that she showed absolutely no remorse during it. Now you think about what she's up for. She's up for the catastrophic injuries and subsequent murder of a little girl. Now, no matter who you are or where you are, the reflection process that you have in prison whilst you're waiting for your court date is to process, how the hell have I ended up here? What has gone so wrong in my life that I am in a prison cell charged with the murder of a little girl? You would imagine that the pangs of guilt might just start to chip away at you to the point where when you're in court, you're going to demonstrate the reality of your actions has suddenly landed heavy on your shoulder and you cannot believe that you went ahead and did what you did and you're going to show that to the jury, to the judge, because that's important. Imagine being so without empathy, so without an understanding of what you have done, a conscience that is so at peace with violence that you can't even act sad. You don't even get to a point where you can try to emulate what a normal, well-adjusted human being would be feeling should they arrive at such a horrible circumstance. Now, on the 14th of December 2021, that's after the seven-week trial, Brockhill's found guilty of Starr's murder. Smith was found not guilty of murder, but she was found guilty of causing or allowing her daughter's death. Smith did actually cry uncontrollably as the verdicts were delivered. Again, we have to be aware that also she'd lost her father, so I guess there was a lot of emotion. Also, we can note that even though she was a violent, reprehensible, horrible mother, she had previously and prior to this relationship had loving relationships and probably is aware of how her life is going to change beyond measure now she's known as somebody who caused her own child's death. When they sentenced two of them, 
This happened on the 15th of December 2021. Judge Mrs Justice Lambert sentenced Smith to eight years and the judge did that saying that she was a neglectful and callous parent who thought only of her own interests. The maximum sentence she could have received was 14 years and I have to say eight years out in four massively lenient something's gone wrong there in my opinion really when you think about all the opportunities there were to save that child and none of them happened and then the person who's actually responsible for that death is managing to just get four years in prison for killing her daughter and okay it might not have been her hands that killed her daughter but it was her actions that massively contributed to it and she could have stopped it so eight years is what she was given 14 would have been far more suitable now, the reason that the judge came to this conclusion was because they took into account her immaturity. They took into account the violence at the hands of Brock Hill, although there were only a few incidents that were noted, and also the fact that she had a clean record. They were all considered mitigating factors. Also, the judge took into the fact that she had lost her daughter and that she must live with the guilt of the part that she played. The judge told Smith it was her role as Star's mother to protect her from harm. Now, I'm conflicted here. Because to live with guilt, you have to care. Is there a punishment there? And think about the sustained level of abuse that that child suffered over months. The fact that she ignored her when she had a broken leg. The fact that she let her partner do horrific things to her in front of her. The fact they videoed stuff. Is there going to be guilt there? <sighs> I'm not convinced there's any guilt there. Now, Despite the plain evidence of abuse, another thing that was brought up is that she failed to contact the police or health services, she failed to seek help from the family, she failed to end the relationship with Brock Hill, and actually, she failed to tell the truth when social services on several occasions came to see the child. Really struggling here to figure out where her parental guilt is going to exist in her mind. Seems to me that she's very self-serving and egotistical, but nevertheless, this is what played out. Brock Hill was sentenced to life and she got a minimum term of 25 years. She laughed when the sentence was read out. She laughed. She smiled, blew kisses and gave a thumbs up to relatives in the public gallery. If I'd have been the judge, I'd have been like, oh, it's just a wait a minute, wait a minute. Guys, I'm oh, sorry, did I, say, did I say 25 years? Did I say 25 years? Oh no, yeah, I did. I did, say, I said 25 years, but you all just, took it like that was it. Like that was just the first part of my judging. So we're just gonna reconvene and you're gonna get another 50 years for all these other offenses I'm gonna add up and then I'm gonna make you serve them one after the other as opposed to at the same time. That would have happened if I had been Justice Kenny. The fact that she's like laughing and blowing kisses just disgusts me, just disgusts me. And it's telling you something very clearly, isn't it? She has no respect for the life that she's taken. She doesn't care. And also, she clearly feels fully supported by her relatives, which, let me tell you, if any of your relatives are watching now, maybe don't support her. Maybe at the moment that she violently abused and murdered an innocent child, you take away the support because she doesn't deserve it and she isn't learning. There's no consequences there if you're just turning up and being nice to her, patting her on the head and saying it's all gonna be okay in the end, you still care for her. What she did was horrific. Like I said at the very beginning of this, she's known to be notoriously violent. Why would you wanna condone her? The judge actually stated, the fact that Star was so vulnerable and because of your relationship with her afforded you the opportunity to mistreat her. The judge accepted Brockle hadn't actually intended to kill Star. However, she fully accepted that she'd intended to cause her really serious injuries. She did bring up the fact that only prior to this, there'd been one known previous conviction. It was basically a public order offence for throwing an egg. Surprising escalation and offending with respect to that. And also, oh my God, the irony. This girl gets an offence for throwing an egg, but social services and the police can visit her on several occasions and allow her to beat the crap out of a child and just get away with it because she said she didn't do it or there'd been an accident that she couldn't help and yet somehow she doesn't get any kind of conviction for that but throwing an egg well that was bang to rights wasn't it there's a public outcry at these sentences by the way and i would have been the same if i'd been in that court smith's granddad frank referred to them as staggeringly soft sentences he said is that all star's life is worth 
Frankie will be out in four years. How is that justice? She watched a child die. She lied repeatedly to cover hers and Brock Hill's tracks. They both deserve to rot in hell. It's disgusting. It's her own family members. And that's how they feel. Now, because of this outcry, the matter has actually been referred to the Attorney General because people think that the sentences are unduly lenient, so they could get increased. I hope they do. I really do. I think they both need to be increased. Certainly, the mother's needs to be increased, without a doubt. Now, it's absolutely tragic beyond belief that Star went from a loving, caring environment with extended family who genuinely loved her to a place of torturous abuse and violence. Star's great-granddad, David, stated... She was so safe and then dragged down to hell. And he was right. It's exactly what happened. She really was dragged down to hell because you couldn't have met somebody more devilish than Brock Hill and Smith as a partnership. He also described Brock Hill as pure evil. I think a lot of us will connect with that belief. He also said, we were just a quiet, lovely family and she ascended from the bowels of hell and just completely devastated and wrecked our family. Yeah, but I think we have to remember that she was welcomed in to that home. It's not just Brock Hill. It was Smith who opened that door and let her in. It was Smith who colluded with the abuse. It was Smith who chose her relationship over her daughter. Now, following Starr's tragic death, Bradford Metropolitan Council released a statement. They deeply regretted that not all the warning signs were seen. Any death of a child, wherever it happens, is one death too many. But this happened in our district, in our community, and has had a devastating impact. We are very aware as partners that there is much that we need to learn from this case. We have already put in place actions that will improve our practice so that we learn those lessons. Really? When you said you didn't know who Baby P was, or you didn't understand what the connection was, when you went out five times and did nothing, when you believed the abusers over the family members, when you chose to turn a blind eye to the catastrophic impact those adults were having on that little girl. You're going to learn some lessons, are you? A little bit too late. And we've been learning lessons for a long time since I've worked in safeguarding in my 20 years of working in this field. Believe me, I'm waiting for the lessons to get learned. I hear a lot of people talking about lessons, but I don't often hear the learning being played out in reality. Boris Johnson stated, a commissioner will look into the capability and capacity of Bradford Council. He also quotes, we must protect children from these barbaric crimes and ensure lessons are learned. Which is rich, coming from you, Boris Johnson, a guy who contributed massively to children being locked down with their abusers. So I'm afraid that the words that you're saying and speaking mean absolutely nothing. And so too, do I believe that the council are going to learn? No. I believe what they'll do is what usually happens. They'll write a nice big report, say what's meant to happen, and then things will just carry on as they always have and more children will die. This isn't just about lessons being learned. This is an instrumental requirement to completely transform the way that social work is done when it comes down to vulnerable children. It is time to listen to children's needs. When people report them, because they can see that horrible things are happening and those individuals are ignored, even when it's from five different sources, you haven't got learning to do. You've got an entire rethinking of your system because there is clearly so much bias in there that it is broken. And to bring it into effect, the fact that all she needed to do was say that it was racism because she was from a travel background or that it was homophobia because she was in a relationship in a same-sex way and that's enough to close people down because they're afraid of offending people. Offend people. Go ahead and offend people. Take a risk. You might do. Look, you might say something, do something, act in a way that causes some offence because maybe it's true at points that somebody's being malicious over a homosexual relationship. Maybe it's true that somebody's being racist. I get it. But you need to investigate thoroughly before you come to that conclusion. Risk offending people. Because if we don't, this is the kind of stuff that happens. People use it as an excuse to say that they're just being maligned by people and you're so scared of upsetting people because they fit a certain paradigm that you don't want to push the boundaries for fear that there might be repercussions. Well, guess what? The repercussion of offending someone is just that. The repercussion of ignoring child abuse and safeguarding 
is star died. So I don't have any patience with these reports. I don't even believe that the people writing them and the people who take it from them will actually do more than pay lip service to this. It is a growing problem. The whole system needs to be overhauled as far as I'm concerned. Now, David regularly talks to Smith in prison. He does. And he stated, she talks as if Star is still here. She still can't get her head around her death. She never went to her daughter's funeral and has never been to her grave. No, no. She didn't get a ticket to that when she was involved in the murder of a child. You've usurped your position as a mother. I mean, you gave birth to your child. That makes you a mother, but only biologically. What makes you a mother is that you'll lie down your life for that child. You'll do anything to protect them. You'll act as a screen between them and the world to protect them fully. That's what makes you a mother. Your unending, unconditional, protective love that knows no bounds. She lost her place the minute she introduced Brockill into her life and let that child be damaged. So I'm glad that she's never been to that grave and I don't think she should ever be allowed there, ever, no matter what happens in the future. This case I've covered because I feel more and more outrageously angry with the way we are failing children. And it's not just in the UK, it's all across the Western world and of course everywhere else as well. But in the Western world, we're meant to have created a developed system where we understand the needs of a child are paramount and we protect them paramount wise. And yet here I am, within a week, covering another completely unnecessary loss. Another loss where services were involved and they failed. I'm the first person to say when people do a good job. You watch any of my videos, there's lots of videos I talk about the services doing amazing things, the police in particular and so on and so forth. But my God, when they fail and they keep failing, we need to bring them into account. And let me tell you, I'm not blaming individual social workers. Got a lot of friends who've been social workers, a lot of left as well because it's incredibly challenging for them. The job is not an easy one. What I'm saying is fundamentally there is an institutional failure to listen to the needs of the child often over the abusers because adults can spin a yarn and be convincing and manipulative and that's what abusers are and do. Unless we advocate for that child, first and foremost, at a cost of offending the parents, at a cost of offending the family, we are failing. I hope that if you've listened to this, you feel the same, I would say, rageful intent strategically to make your voices known, to make it clear that this was not good enough, to hold to account the systems that are meant to protect our children, but have failed them. And as I've said, just to hammer the point home, and I know some of you don't like my politics, and I appreciate that. Everyone's welcome here, including the people who disagree with me fundamentally. But please, again, Think about it when lockdowns are getting peddled in front of our noses once again at this time of year. Think about what we're gonna do to those children behind those closed doors with those abusers, given free access fundamentally to do what they will, with no eyes on them, with no one to protect them, literally placed with their wolves. That's what lockdowns do. Star, Arthur, all the children that have lost their lives. We've got to do better, guys. We've got to do better. Like I said, I want it to be known that Smith's family in particular, incredibly loving, caring, compassionate group of people who should never have lost that child. And the reality is for Brock Hill's family, she should not be in a situation where they're getting intimidated, beaten up and threatened, no matter how reprehensible their behavior is in supporting her and being there to blow kisses back to her in court. We've got to remember that there's not just violence, there's not just killing, is there? Thanks for joining me. It's been a really hard one. Like I said, let's forget Brockhill and Smith's names. Let's just remember Star. Let's remember Star for the little star that she was, for the joy that she brought, for the laughter that she created, for the momentary experience on this planet that enriched her great grandparents and grandparents' lives. Let's remember it that way and let's work like hell to stop these kind of things becoming commonplace in our society, which seems to be something that more and more is normalised. And in fact, I think we maybe have to have a conversation about the normalisation of child death that seems to be going on a lot in the press right now. My job is to think not about adults, 
they can think for themselves. My desire is to think about children and children generations to come. It's them that we need to protect. And for every mother and father, sister and brother, anybody out there who has a relationship with young children, you have to be their guardians, you have to be their advocates. And the way that we are as a society right now, we are failing fundamentally on a safeguarding level. Safeguarding says that we have to protect children from harm, abuse and neglect. And my God, have the past two years proven that we've done exactly the opposite. So I apologise for my politics for those of you who don't like it, but I won't apologise for safeguarding children. And I'll fight to the death to ensure that their rights are heard. And I'll call to account all those who fail to do that. Leave me your comments. I'd really like to know how you feel about this. I know it's a tough one, but I want to honour her. That little girl coped with more than most of us will ever have to cope with in our lives in her short time on this planet. I hope she is with her granddad. I hope he really is that guardian that she's got now, carrying her through the next life until she gets to meet all those who loved her. Take care. Like I said, let me know what you're thinking. If you like what you've seen here and you want to know more, please subscribe, get your notifications on, leave me a comment. Get involved in a live chat. It will be a very rowdy one, I imagine, this one because we're all feeling so triggered by it. And just take care of yourselves, guys. And maybe go and hug your kids a little bit tighter, yeah? And notice a little bit more if you see things that are standing out. And if you ever have to do a social services referral, refer to these cases and don't accept it when they say, it's okay, they've told us everything's fine. Be that voice because you will save a life. You really will. Be the difference. See you soon, guys. Mm -hmm.